Evening everyone, welcome to the front line. My name's Joe Glanville and I'm really delighted to be here with Ian Overton to talk about his fascinating new book, The Price of Paradise, which is, um, as you'll see, um, the story of how the suicide bomber shaped the modern age. And it's very, very rightly been very highly acclaimed. Um, just to give you a little bit of Ian's um, background before we start, um, he's an award-winning journalist and a human rights campaigner and he's reported from over two dozen conflict zones in his career. He runs the London-based charity Action on Armed Violence, and he's worked for the BBC, ITN, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. He oversees the only global monitor of explosive violence around the world, and his first book, Gun, Baby, Gun, looked at our relationship with firearms and the rise in gun crime. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the book, if you haven't read it, it's a history of suicide bombing, but it's also a gripping piece of current affairs reportage where Ian travels the world um, investigating the history and the continuing story of suicide bombing. But it's also, I think, very unusually a manifesto. It's a manifesto for action to address the very significant toll of suicide bombing, not just the casualties, but the actual impact on society. And one of the most staggering statistics in the book, among many very striking statistics, is the figure for the number who've been killed and harmed since the very first suicide bomb exploded as far back as 1881, Ian dates it, in Imperial Russia. The number of people who have been killed or uh, who have been casualties of suicide bombings is a quarter of a million which is a really astonishing figure. And Ian, to help us get the measure of that, says that is greater than the casualty lists of the Battle of Gettysburg, the first day of the Somme, Pearl Harbor, and the Battle of Kisan, all combined. Um, so that gives you something of the measure of, of the physical impact of suicide bombing. But Ian, I, I'm interested to ask you first, um, as someone who's been a journalist, investigative journalist for many years, where your personal interest in this begins, in this subject? Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I think, ultimately, I've been driven by data. So Action on Armed Violence, every single day, looks at English language media reports around the world. And we, whenever the word suicide bombing or suicide attack is used, we record that and how many casualties there are. And I began to look at the, the breakup. So of all explosive violence uh, around the world, around 50% of that is from improvised explosive to violence used by non-state actors, and around 50% is used by state actors. So I began to look into the non-state actor harm, and shockingly, around 70% of all of that non-state actor harm was through suicide bombs. Mm. So when I looked at the overall picture, having just written a book about guns, I found that the, uh, the second largest killer of civilians today, after the AK-47, mm. is the suicide bomber. Mm. So it kind of made sense that after I've written a book about guns, then I go on to suicide bomb. But the real catalyst for doing this was I was invited by the Foreign Office to speak at an, an event in a place called Wilton Park, and it's a very sort of... Downton Abbey-esque setting and it was all very cordial and genteel and everyone was being polite. And we had this entire day around improvised explosive devices and what we should do in, in a landmined world. And the British government, in some degree influenced by Lady Diana, has invested huge amounts of money in clearing the world from landmines. And this is very noble. But the truth is that most manufactured landmines that were the impetus for Lady Diana to, to, to really bring the issue to attention, they've been cleared in many parts of the world. And the number of people killed or injured by these are quite small. And I stood up in that meeting and I said, we haven't discussed suicide attacks at all in this post-landmine threat. Why not? And nobody had an answer. Mm. And that evening, the Manchester bombing attack occurred. And and the next day we had a, a two minute silence for the victims of that attack. And I kind of sat there after the two minutes of silence and, and nobody mentioned suicide bombings for the rest of the day. And it kind of caused a bit of fury in me because I thought, how can we ignore something so great? And as a consequence of this book, um, 
it, 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 I've actually managed to persuade the United Nations to hold their first ever event on suicide bombing. Um, so, you know, there's been some sort of, I think, actual physical outcome mm. of the book as well as, uh, as being a book in itself. Well, that's, that's very interesting to hear. And when is that going to happen? So that's already happened. Oh, so it we, has. We, we, we had that in Geneva um, in August, and then I had a second event in New York at the United Nations a few mm. weeks ago. Um, and the, the impetus of that, and it might sound crazy, but we're trying to actually create a ban on the suicide vest. Mm. And that might sound weird, but the thing is, if you understand the UN systems, it unlocks money and funding for things like victim assistance if the UN has a remit. So in many ways, it, it's trying to create a kind of a moral opprobrium, a, a, a damnation of, of this instrument, and as well unlock UN... Mm. Uh, factors that might then result in, in victim assistance and, and change. And how would you go about banning a suicide Well, um, so, so I, I think you have to acknowledge the naivety of, of the, the claim. Um, and you say, well, you know, non-state actors aren't immediately going to adhere. But I um, did, my did my postgraduate in the um, poison gas attack of April 1915 in uh, the Western Front. Uh, there was one previously in the Eastern Front, but the Western Front really caught the world's attention. And the Germans claimed that this poison gas attack would be the, the weapon to stop all wars. And there's a great deal of celebration of poison gas in Germany in 1915. And it was met with initial moral opprobrium, then the Brits began to adopt it, and then the world eventually came to a, a conclusion that poison gas is beyond the acceptable use of of weapons, and nowadays it's, ra it's a rarity to see poison gas being used. And I think if we can have that kind of moral opprobrium used with poison gas, then over time I'm not unconvinced that we can't have that similar moral opprobrium with suicide gas. So there's a kind of a, an element of condemnation that occurs in a ban. But more importantly, I think what it opens up is the shocking truth is I've met people who have lost their legs in suicide bomb attacks, and they're not eligible for the same funding you would get if you lost your legs in a landmine attack. Wow. And that, to me, mm. is an offence. In fact, I think, again, one of the striking things about your book is the attention that you give to the, to the victims of suicide bombings. Mm. And there are some really deep... I mean, there are some really deeply disturbing descriptions that you go into of what being a casualty means, of how um, the, the shrapnel, but also the other after effects of a suicide bomb um, can affect you, that I've never read anywhere before, actually. And so it's, 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 that's very original material. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not, um, I mean, I don't try and get into any kind of pornography of violence. Um, I, I try and have a measured approach, but it, um, some of the some of the work I've I managed to find on the, the 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 impact of suicide bombings is deliberately kept quite within the circles of the medical environment because of the fear that bombers will um, then go and and read this medical equipment and then go and cause a bomb on themselves. I think this is um, a, a, an overstep in protecting evidence because um, it, most people who are willing to go and blow themselves up know explicitly what it's going to do to people. But the, the thing about um, suicide bombing is, is the suicide bomb is, m it causes a higher lethality rate than any other form of explosive weapon. But also it has profound um, challenging issues when it comes to the, the, the victim's recovery. So, so for instance, it's the only weapon, well, not the only weapon, but largely the only weapon where you get bits of the, the, the attacker's body implanted in your body if you're hurt. So in 7-7, seven, seven, in Manchester, in lots and lots of places, what they've had to do is extract bits of bones of the, 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 the perpetrator. So you're harmed on a, on a quite profound level. Um, it, it's also obviously got a profound PTSD effect because the carnage, and if any of you have witnessed the, the after effects of a suicide bomb, you, can, you know just how much, it's like a butcher's slaughterhouse, it's appalling. Um, but uh, the, the other shocking things which I found, which I didn't realize, is if your, your limb is blown off in a suicide bomb um, and then you have surgery, um, your bone, um, for a whole variety of reasons, is called ossification, but your bone starts to grow. So your limb isn't just 
fixed. It, it begins to grow beyond its original position um, in terms of where the amputation has occurred. And so people who have a prosthetic might have to have an another prosthetic after a year, or after three years, after six. So it's a lifelong illness. And then the third thing, which I, I, I really had no idea about, was it causes this inflammatory cascade in your immune system. So someone who's blown up um, ages faster than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And it can cut their life short by you know, 15 years or so. So there is this sort of long-term trauma, mental trauma, physical trauma, um, and emotional trauma that, that um, you know, is often hidden or certainly not talked about. And I think that, that it, it, whilst it is hard reading, I think that there's mm -hmm. a, maybe sometimes a moral duty that we understand mm -hmm. the true impact of conflict. Because if we don't understand really what conflict does, then it leads for us to believe that conflict is somehow an easier weapon to use. It is a kind of a, an extension mm -hmm. of politics by other means, and we think that that's just an acceptable extension. But I think we need to understand that conflict is grisly and gruesome, mm -hmm. even if it is uncomfortable reading. I'd like to come back to some of that, but let's let's go back to the birth, to the origins, the the first suicide bomb in 1881, mm. uh, which obviously was not um, carried out in exactly the way that it is now, but it was the first time that that had happened. And I'm wondering whether you can see the elements there, the idea of sacrifice, the idea of some kind of better world whether all those elements were already there in the 19th century suicide bomber. So, so the, the world's first suicide attack killed the Tsar of Russia. Um, and if you go to St. Petersburg today, uh, it, it's a city that's elaborately, and, and, and it's like Paris on steroids. It's, it, it's, it's the sort of enlightenment writ large. And right in the middle of the city is this classical Russian church that looks like uh, an imposition, but it's sort of Russia there, and, and that is the church of the, the spilt blood. And um, it marked the spot where uh, the Tsar of Russia was killed. And his, his, his murderer was a young radical um, who uh, belonged to this radical group called the People's Will. Uh, which uh, I think resonates with modern-day Britain, with everything about the people's will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they came out of various other radical groups. One was called Hell, um, uh, uh, and all of them, in a sense, were high on this um, post-French revolutionary rhetoric. Uh, and and uh, those who have been to St. Petersburg will know how French that city is, how much it was built on sort of this French ideal uh, of, um, of, of architecture as well as being infused of, um, you know, uh, cafes and uh, libraries filled with French books. I mean, there's, if you want to study Voltaire, you pretty have to go to St. Petersburg Library. Um, and um, these young men, and almost all young men, were absolutely high on this notion that they could, by decapitating the Russian throne, usher in this glorious new age of reformation. They were acutely conscious of the notion that they didn't want to uh, set off another terror. Um, uh, they didn't want mass slaughter. They didn't want um, uh, a, a form of, of, of they wanted targeting killing. And it was that combination of, of, of a belief that a death of a, a tyrant, in their eyes, could usher in a golden age. Um, the belief that um, a targeted death wouldn't result in a cascade of violence, and also this moment where they basically had gotten hold of this remarkable new invention by Alfred Nobel, who now obviously has the Peace Prize named after him, but Alfred Nobel, the inventor of uh, TNT. And Nobel's dynamite um, offered them a unique opportunity to make this dynamite at home, uh, and incidentally, the man who made the first suicide bomb, also in his cell, um, invented uh, the first direct jet-fueled rocket. And, and so in, in sp inspirational was this jet-fueled rocket that they've even named a, a crater on the moon after him. Um, so the, the, the inventor of the first suicide bomb is forever commemorated on the moon. But um, he, the person who blew himself up, um, they had this challenge. They, they had the dynamite. And across Europe around this time, you kept on seeing cafes being blown up, and there were lots of attacks in, in, in Britain, for instance, and IEDs were increasingly commonplace, but IEDs were indiscriminate, inherently. What they found was that they, want, they got the dynamite, but they wanted to try and blow up the Tsar 
directly. Um, and this is where the suicide bomber notion came in. Because the suicide bomber, obviously driven by a human, can place himself at the right time, at the right place, and detonate the explosive. So they become the world's first targeted missile. And in many ways, we see that even today. The targeted missile element of it is the poor man's drone, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that, that really w was... And, and they tried to kill the Tsar again and again. I think it was the seventh time he had, he had been uh, an assassination attempt. So they were very frustrated. Um, but they, they genuinely believed that they would usher in this, this utopia of Russian uh, um, idealism uh, with the death of the Tsar. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it not only was it infused with this sort of French Enlightenment idea of, of in order for there to be great change, blood must be let, but it was also infused, strangely, in the Russian case, I think, with a kind of a millenarian Christianity, mm -hmm. this notion that sacrifice was an important part of duty. Um, and um, I think sort of Russian virtues of sacrifice are infused with the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. So whilst we ascribe lots to Islam and the suicide bomber today, I think actually, strangely, its origin, uh, in terms of that sort of notion of blowing yourself up to create a utopia that you will never inhabit came mm -hmm. out of a much more or almost Judeo-Christian Judeo uh, background, or well, mm -hmm. particularly Christian background, of the virtues of sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Christ on the cross, etc., etc. Mm. You, you write about the, the strategy behind suicide bombing, and, and you go, so the history goes through the, the kamikaze pilots, um, Tamil Tigers, um, and uh, and clearly for the for the kamikaze pilots, it was one of the ways that they could um, challenge American supremacy, um, and in the Iran Iraq War as well, it was strategic. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that sits with the the ideology that 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 is behind suicide bombing and whether you can have one without the other can can the strategy ever work if you don't have that ideology of self-sacrifice utopia the better world well every single military group that i've analyzed that uh has used suicide bombers certainly is backed up with this notion that they are it is the best weapon to usher in uh, this, this, this glorious life. So uh, in the case of the Tamil Tigers, it was rooted in nationalism. In the case of the kamikaze in Japan, uh, it was the preservation of imperial Japan um, and, and the, the belief in the godhead of the emperor. Um, and obviously in modern day um, uh, ISIS, uh, it was Baghdadi being the kind of the, the, the savior and the notion that the caliphate would be the utopia of the masses. But what, was, what I didn't realize is that I, it was almost like the suicide bomber to a degree as a kind of contagious element. So it began with Russian radicals, the death of the Tsar, and then there was around five or six other suicide attacks in Russia in the, in the next 20 years. Then you began to see suicide attacks occurring amongst Chinese radicals trying to destroy the Chinese imperial court. And then you began to see it being adopted by the Chinese military against the Russian military. And then, the, and then you saw it, the Chinese military against the Japanese military, and then the Japanese military began to use it against the Chinese military. So in the 1930s, you saw attacks where the Chinese were charging at Japanese suicide bombers and meeting midway. All of this was quite improvised, but it really came to the fore in 1944 in Japan, where the, the, finally the emperor, it, it, the, despite there have been lots and lots of, sort of banzai charges in the jungles of the South Pacific, it was in 1944 where there was an absolute di dictum that you could use these zero planes and fly headlong into U.S. fleets. And, and that kind of seal of approval in Japan just led to an app, like 10,000 people overnight volunteered to go and, uh, and be kamikaze pilots. So there was this extreme wave. And, and I think we've seen a similar extreme wave in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier about 250,000 people being killed or injured by suicide bombers since the Tsar of Russia. What, the thing that's really struck me is that 40% of all people killed by suicide bombers have died in the last five years. Wow, the last five years? Five years, yeah. That's extraordinary. Yeah. And, and that's really why I, I, I wrote mm. the book, just mm. to highlight that, that real you know, shocking um, yeah. shift. And what, what I think the reason why it's so absolute at the moment is you've got this combination of utopianism, 
which is held by Salafist jihadists who believe in the, in the creation of a caliphate. You have this targeted weaponry system that's similar to what the kamikaze used. And then you've also got something that is unique and came out of the Middle East, is the cultivation of the martyr. Right, so that's what I um, want to talk to you about. Yeah. <laughs> um, and th the moment that you write about very vividly where um, obviously there is, you know, in Shia Islam, there is a long history of martyrdom mm. around the history of, of that branch of Islam. And you write about this moment in the Iran-Iraq war where the, 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 the self-sacrificing, the, the, su the, the suicide bomber as we know it is born, yeah. but in, in the f on the front line of the Iran-Iraq war, and we're talking about children mm. as part of the suicide bombers, the first one being in 1980, a 13-year-old child. And then you have these martyrdom brigades. You have um, suicide bombing being venerated by the state, by the Iranian state being, being promoted, this kind of glorious death. So this is, this is the beginning, isn't it, of the cult of martyrdom? This is the pivotal moment from which we can trace where we are today. Yeah, so, so um, most people, when they think of modern-day suicide bombing, post-2001, around 95% of all suicide bombers have been by what people would describe as Salafist jihadists. And Salafist jihadists is a small group that exists within something called Salafism or Wahhabism, but it's a, equally a smallish group that exists within the grand scheme of Sunni Islam. And Sunni Islam, um, as I'm sure you know, is after the death of Muhammad, Sunni Islam agreed that um, the, 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 the uh, basis of Islam, the leader of Islam, would follow that, that person most likely to have been appointed by um, Muhammad on his death. So it, didn't, it wasn't a bloodline, it was a line of political succession. Whereas the Shia faith believed absolutely in the bloodline. And within that bloodline, they had early martyrs. Um, Ali was probably the most famous one. Um, and you see it in the Shia veneration of the martyr today, where they, in, in certain parts of Shia Islam, they whip themselves on their annual commemoration of the death of Ali. Um, and and the, the, the Shia tradition, a little bit like Catholicism, venerates the martyr explicitly. Mm -hmm. But there you have an Iran-Iraq war, a beleaguered Iran on the cusp, who oh, just had this revolution, under attack by Saddam Hussein's forces, and they were totally outnumbered. They're losing people def left, right, and center. And this 13-year-old, Fahmida, um, grabbed a, a, a belt of grenades and threw himself under an Iranian tank, uh, sorry, an Iraqi tank. And the, and the tank exploded, and uh, the, the young 13-year-old died. And the Ayatollah Khomeini, who had just created this Iranian revolution, but suddenly saw this as a moment where martyrdom and sacrifice can be aligned with political revolutionary will. Mm. And in a way, he, 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 I think he used that notion to um, expand the, this idea that there could be a sheer revolution infused with the blood of the martyrs. Because, and, and this goes to the very root of something which is a psychological notion that you see again and again in every suicidal troop used, which is, if a cause is worth dying for, then why won't you join it? So death re-establishes the notion that this is a, a cause of virtue. So the Ayatollah Khomeini absolutely grasped onto this icon of Fahmida. He put him on the Iranian banknotes, he made hospitals named after him, streets named after him, golden statues erected in his honor. And, and from that came this battalions of young boys mm. all signing up. Mm. And I think that notion of martyrdom, first born in Iran, then began to spread throughout the Middle East, particularly into Lebanon. Yes, and I suppose that is, and obviously we know that Iran had a very specific political strategy, which was to export the revolution. You know, that's what Khomeini wanted to do, and that's what he did in Lebanon, and that's what we saw in Lebanon yeah. uh, with Hezbollah. Um, but what's extraordinary, I suppose, um, and I suppose you could say that, that, I suppose you could say that the export of the revolution actually was very limited, and its, its, its most successful product has turned out to be the suicide bomber. I think the, the most successful product has definitely been the martyr, and, and the way that it has infused not just sheer rhetoric, but, and this is the crucial thing, it sort of leapfrogged into first communist and nationalistic rhetoric in Lebanon, and then ended up 
uh, leaping into Sunni rhetoric. Which is extraordinary, really, because yeah. as, as you were explaining, it's a very different tradition. It's a very different outlook on the world, yeah. the Sunni and the, sh the Shia outlook on the world. And Sunni is the majority branch, has the sort of biggest number, is far, far, 90%, I think, of Islam. Yeah, so if, if you go to, to Lebanon, um, you see, as you drive along the highway, huge posters for Shia martyrs who have fallen in the various conflicts of Lebanon against the uh, um, Am Americans, against the French, against the is particularly against the Israelis. Um, and yet, then if you go to, to the uh, Palestine, you see a similar, almost a copycat use of those that veneration of the martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And and if you weren't told that one was Shia and one was Sunni, you wouldn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely been a profound appropriation. And, and you can even locate the place where this happened. So um, in 1992, Itzhak Rabin uh, exiled a whole group of Palestinian fighters who were on to, to go on to become Hamas fighters. And he exiled them from Palestine to this, this um, godforsaken field, uh, which they've rather dramatically and poetically called the Field of Flowers, but it's just a field of, of crumpled stones as far as I can see. You wouldn't want to sleep in it. And th they exiled them there. And this group of the, these young men, but they sort of set up their own little community. And they had a, 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 a mosque. They had a, a university. They had medical outlets. But duly, groups from Iranian-sponsored Hezbollah, you know, Shias, sat down with these Sunni exiles and said to them, you know what? We have used the suicide bomber. We destroyed the Iraqi embassy in Beirut. We, we forced the Americans and the French to leave Lebanon through the force of the suicide bomber. And all of a sudden, I think the Hamas began to see that as a, as a, as a great weapon. And on their return to Israel, because they were allowed back in, uh, there was this within, seven within nine months, there were seven separate suicide attacks in Israel from suicide bombers. Wow. Um, the other sort of interesting thing here is that although suicide bombing is perpetrated by non-state groups, it's, a, it's, you know, it's an act of terrorism. From what you've been saying, um, it would never have taken off had it not been a state-supported enterprise. And then, of course, later on, Saudi is, you know, is a supporter um, f giving financial backing. Qatar has also supported groups. So they look as if they're loan operators, but they're not. Exactly. And I, and I think this is the, the intriguing thing of, of uh, if you look at the financial ways in which Salafist jihadism has both spread and um, become emboldened, um, you absolutely see murky backing in the in the background, and and the role of Saudi uh, financial investment in Wahhabist schools of thought um, and in promoting a certain form of extremist um, Islam has been um, the the great elephant in the room since 2001. Um, the, the, we've seen a rise in well. Recently, there's been a drop-off, but certainly for around a decade, we saw a rise in these fundings of, of extremist mosques, uh, which were often populated by people who didn't have very developed backgrounds in Islamic theology. And this is the curious thing. So it began under Shia, and the Shia state-sponsored Shia clerics um, began to promote the notion that suicide bombing was great um, and, and, and of virtue to, to, uh, to spread the revolution. Um, and a lot of these were educated in quite prestigious uh, s seminaries, if you will, in Iran. And they had quite a coherent view of morality around the suicide bombing. So most sh Shia suicide bombings only targeted state actors. So generally, if you look at Shia orchestrated suicide bombings, around 95% of those killed or injured are other soldiers for other militaries. When it leapt into Sunni Islam, something changed. Because uh, those of you who know Sunni Islam, it's a much flatter religion. There's many, many different mosques. Shia Islam has three fundamental leaders, uh, whereas Sunni Islam has tens of thousands of different imams who all have different interpretations of the Quran and various other forms of, of, of Islam, of, of text. And a lot of those imams have backgrounds. If you look at their background, like Baghdadi, for instance, or Zakawi, 
they, they've got backgrounds in the sciences. They're engineers, they're chemists, they're economists. They almost have quite a black and white view of the world. It's good or evil. It's almost Manichean, if you will. And um, these individuals then have quite a sort of a, a, a knee-jerk response. They're, they, they don't have this, this grand uh, theological understanding of the limitations of violence. And, they ex they, and therefore, they begin to comb through the evidence to justify post hoc their targeting of civilians. So um, around 70% of all people killed or injured by Sunni suicide bombers have been civilians. And that was the fundamental difference. When it became unshackled from the Shia tradition and shifted into Sunni tradition, the Ayatollah Khomeini was able to and did put a halt to, Sunni, to Shia suicide bombers. So there are very, very, very few Shia suicide bombers today, a few in Yemen, but basically it doesn't exist. Whereas when it entered Sunni Islam, it was like the wild west of theology. Mm. And, and that, I think, we're still seeing the reverberations of today. And with the death of Baghdadi, do you think that that could have any impact on how ISIS continue to operate? Well, this is a, so if you, if you sit down and really read some of the, and I've, I've watched maybe 75 death videos of suicide bombers, and you really understand what their argument is, it is quite terrifying in a way, because they believe uh, the, the, the extremist ISIS type Salafist jihadists, um, they believe that uh, in order for them to have victory, death must come first. That, that they will only achieve their caliphate at the 11th sort of the, the, the 58th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day, etc. Et It'll be the last minute moment where everything feels like darkness. They believe that Jesus Christ will descend clad in a yellow cloak on a minaret in Jerusalem. And in that moment, the caliphate will be reborn. Um, so Baghdadi put himself out there as being the leader of the caliphate. But because this prediction didn't happen, what I think you'll find is that people will dismiss Baghdadi as not the true uh, Mahdi, the, 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 the returned Mahdi, who will come back and, and usher in a new caliphate. They'll dismiss him and look for another one. Um, and, and yes, we haven't really seen Baghdadi m much for the last few years. But so far this year, we've had 22 different countries have witnessed over 200 suicide attacks, killing or injuring around 4,000 civilians. And compare that to 1976. 1976, there were no suicide bombers anywhere in the world. So that you will get people writing that the, 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 way, the age of terror has diminished. But actually, they haven't looked at the evidence that mm. actually the age of terror had just spread thin into countries which are off our radar. Afghanistan today is awash with suicide bombers. There was one yesterday. Mm. There was a memorial of a, an American troop killed by a suicide bomber today. I mean, every single day I get a terrible alert about suicide bombings around the world. And it's places like uh, the strands of East Africa um, um, and, and West Africa as well, and places like Nigeria, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan. You're seeing daily attacks, but they're just not really being reported in Western media. It's almost as if what, what began so when the, when the Russian radicals first used it, they called it the propaganda of the deed. And it's almost as if the suicide bomber has become so quotidian, so everyday, mm. that it no longer has that propaganda. And you need, in order to puncture the lethargy, if, if you will, on reporting, just that we're kind of accustomed to it, you need an attack on 12-year-old girls in Manchester. And that's the terrible, that's the terrible impetus of it. I just wanted to give all of you a chance to ask a question now, if you'd like to, um, having just had that um, rather chilling statement from Ian. <laughs> um, would anyone like to jump in with a question? Don't worry if you aren't ready. You'll have a chance later. No? OK. OK, at the back. Oh, from the BBC. Um, I, I was just, hi, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, hi there. I was <laughs> just listening to your, um, your hopes that, uh, um, you know, you one day suicide bombing would be like chemical weapons attacks. I mean, there is a big difference, isn't there, that you, you have nation states signing up to a, a prohibition on chemical weapons, and, and the people who are using suicide attacks tend not to be nation states. They are uh, terrorist groups who do not sign up to any sort of uh, conventional norms that other militaries would do. Um, so 
I just wondered if, if that's perhaps a little bit naive on your part, hoping that that's going to happen. Um, well, uh, what I think it, 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 will, it will not sway extremist Salafist jihadists who want the entire temple, so to speak, to burn down. They, 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 they would gladly blow up the UN. But groups like um, the Tamil Tigers, for instance, in Sri Lanka, generally wanted a seat at the table. So I think nationalist groups would not use suicide bombers. The Kurds have used a couple. And I think that when you point out to Kurdish fighters that they have used a few suicide bombers, they rapidly try and shut down that, that statement. They don't like you talking. And I've, had, I've been trolled quite heavily on social media for daring to tell the truth about Kurdish suicide bombers. So, yes, I, I absolutely agree. It, it, there's a certain naivety when it comes to expecting people who would want to blow up everything to ad adhere to what is considered Western norms uh, or, or international norms. Um, and actually, I think within there's a, an intriguing element, is that um, the suicide bomber, I think, in the Salafist jihadist notion represents almost an entire rejection of westernized approaches towards punishment. So the West very much has shifted from public punishments in the 18th century, where we would see beheading and, and, and executions in the town square, all the way through to the executions being put behind prison walls, then executions being replaced with long sentences, and then those long sentences being transmuted into solitary confinement. So we've seen a massive spike in solitary confinement. In the US, there's you know, tens of thousands of people in long-term solitary confinement. And it's almost like the, the imprisonment of the soul. When the Salafist jihadists came along, what they did, the first thing they did in the caliphate was drag punishment back into the public square. It was throwing people off rooftops, it was blowing people up, it was using explosive violence on individuals. So in a sense, they were rejecting any international norms. And this, I believe, does have an absolutely existential threat to the United Nations. But the United Nations, the reason I kind of want, as, as, at least if you begin to identify the things that they absolutely reject, then maybe I think that there's the Achilles heel that you can begin to uh, undermine their argument, their framing. So there's a couple of things I think undermines their argument. The first is, for instance, Salafist jihadists um, say, if, you're a, if, if, if I blew myself up right now and you were all good Sunnis, um, that you, and you all went to, to, you'd all go to paradise, you'd all go and hear the, the green birds of Jenna, and everything would be wonderful for you. But what they don't address is what happens if all your legs are blown off and you spend the rest of your life in absolute torturous agony. They have no argument for this, for instance. You sit down with clerics and you, explain, you say to them, well, what happens to you? And they, have no, they haven't uh, addressed that. So partly I want to highlight the long-term agony that the injured incur. Secondly, there's this guy called Ibn Tamiya. And Ibn Tamiya in the 15th century was this um, uh, cleric in the Middle East who basically... Uh, I think he was probably a bit paranoid, but he basically argued that it was entirely acceptable to kill the people living in your own community if they were basically fifth columnists. And he called this the fatwa of Mardin. And that fatwa of Mardin has been appropriated by the Salafist jihadists. They've gone back to some 15th century cleric and really used that to justify the targeting of civilians uh, uh, again and again in mosques and marketplaces around the Middle East and beyond. And my argument of, 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 of inc including a ban on suicide bombers would, I think, reignite the fact that the primary victim is civilians. It would challenge this fatwa of Mardin by, doing, by forcing Muslim states to deny the legitimacy of the fatwa of Mardin. And I think it would um, open up funding for victims. So I appreciate... And, and, and it's absolutely valid to, to and I, even when I'm speaking at the UN, I also highlight how naive my positioning is, but then I underpin it with this, hopefully, a bit more sort of logical, consequential um, uh, effects. Because, you know, but I, 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 I'm conscious, though, that um, I, the, the, the greatest pushback you get when you talk about this issue is, uh, strangely, from states which have the biggest problem. So the moment I mention this at the UN, the Pakistani delegate rush up to me afterwards with their hands flaying, saying, you know, we don't have a problem in this country. What are you talking about? And, and we, it, it's Americans. And you're like, what do you mean it's Americans? And I've literally had, you know, very senior Pakistani journalists telling me all suicide bombers in Pakistan are American fifth columnists. 
Mm. And I'm like, oh, how do you beat that conspiracy theory? So that was one of the big challenges of this entire issue is it's riven with conspiracy theories. As any of you have been you know, to, to, to Middle, East, Middle East stations will know, the, the conspiracy theory is you know, the day-to-day -day banter and people are like, I'm picking it. So the number of times I've been told that 9-11 was by the Jews or you know, it never happened. That's the, that's the interesting one, is that it never happened, which I, I, I struggle with sometimes. Yes. Listening to you, I suppose that if you're in the business of running a suicide bomb organization, nuclear is the way to go. Okay. What is your estimate of when we will see a nuclear suicide bomb and where will it be in your guess? Um, yeah, so I, you saw, I mean, this is a concerning thing about the long history in Iran. So I don't know if you saw a report out today about the amount of depleted uranium that was coming out of Iran or being produced in Iran. That, to me, is, was concerning. Um, th four weeks ago, I was on the Eastern Front in, in Ukraine, and uh, the Russians had undertaken um, nuclear testing and also had stored nuclear waste material in the Donetsk area, or the Donbass area, which is now under uh, control by the Donetsk People's Republic. And what they've done, and this is very concerning, is they've, they've stopped pumping out the groundwater from these mines where this, this nuclear waste uh, exists. And so the, the nuclear waste is seeping into the water levels. It wouldn't take much of a genius to go to places like South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Donetsk People's Republic, um, Iran, in order to get hold of the dirty material for a nuclear bomb. Um, the, there have been reports of North Korean uh, fighters who have been equipped with nuclear bomb suicide backpacks and they've got the remit to run straight into Seoul and blow themselves up in the event of a major attack. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's it, I think it would be a dirty bomb as opposed to a, a manufactured bomb. I, I, I'm not entirely convinced you'd find a state willing to do that. But you know, interestingly, a few years ago, um, I think it was quite a provocative campaign, but somebody put up these posters in Britain uh, about the Royal Navy uh, recruiting suicide bombers, because the argument is if you were on a Royal Navy nuclear submarine and you launched your ships, the heat signature from the launch of that missile would cause your submarine to be immediately counter-striked and blown up. So by launching, you died which I don't think is a suicide bomb itself, but I think uh, that's a, an adjunct. Uh, but I think generally, yes, I think it, that's the stuff of nightmares. Mm. Got another question here. Thank you. C can I go back to your point about uh, being naive? So, so given, <laughs> I don't think you're naive, I, I look at it more as, as hope, but given where we are, um, so, and given conspiracy theories, it, it, so, so, so how do we get there? How do we raise it? We, we, we have a, a current agenda across many nations where it's either a mixture of conspiracy mm. or a narrative that we want to believe or any mm. combination of all. So what's it going to take? How do we get to the point where nations actually agree to sign up to do something about this? Or are we going to be in this state of flux that continues to go on to an inevitable, hopefully not too negative a journey, but yeah. it, it troubles me. Well, I mean, I, I'm, um, I, I kind of have uh, prodded, it, prodded the bear from two angles. One is sort of a critique of what, what's really happening in terms of Salafist jihadism and the, the, the warped theological structures that underpin that, that I think need to be challenged within the Sunni uh, community as a whole. Um, and the reason why a lot of Sunnis don't want to address it is because, understandably, I think I would if I was a Sunni, you'd go, it's nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my religion, you know, I, they don't, they're, they're not with me bro type thing. And, and I think that that um, is both important to address, but it causes a certain denialism. And I think that that denialism should be met um, and overcome. And I, I, I would try and seek funding from states to have groups of religious leaders coming together to debate, particularly the issue of the protection of civilians. So the protection of civilians, I think, is the way towards this. And today, 90% of all those killed or injured by explosive weapons, all forms of explosive weapons, um, who die in populated areas will be civilians. So nine out of 10 people being killed by civilian, uh, pop explosive weapons today in towns and cities are civilians. And that is such a strident truth that it's caused, at the moment, 72 states recently signed um, uh, a dictate, which is part of a, 
uh, a political commitment to stop the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And they, they announced this um, is with the um, Irish government leading the way, along with the Austrian government. They announced this at the first committee of the United Nations a few weeks ago. And th that, I think, is real hope. If you get states agreeing not to use explosive weapons in populated areas, you have a beginning of, again, this sort of opprobrium of the use thereof. And um, I think, th so not only do I prod it from that perspective and trying to highlight the general harms to civilians, but I try and call out states as well. And um, oh, actually, Jonathan um, has worked with me on this uh, at the BBC, and we, um, I, I did a freedom of information request to the RAF recently, um, in, well, it was in February, uh, to ask how many militants they had killed in their, in their strikes over Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. And they said they had killed or injured over 4,300 uh, Syrian and Iraqi militants in their airstrikes. How many civilians did you kill in those airstrikes, I asked. They said one. Mm. Now, I think that feeds the conspiracy theory. Mm. Nobody in their right mind will think that you can drop 500-pound bombs on towns and cities and only kill one civilian. And I think unless the UK government, as the US government has done, has does proper things like civilian casualty counting, then we're all going to be caught in this endless issue of deniability that is fatuous at worst mm -hmm. and at best sorry and 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 so i i'm i'm again i'm in fact i was emailing the mod today saying why haven't you sat down with me yet to discuss this civilian casualty unit and the truth is because um there's this belief and i can understand why because i've spent time with soldiers and generally on a one-to-one -one level british soldiers are some of those remarkable people you'll meet but there's a belief in English exceptionalism, if you will, and there's certainly a belief in that they do no wrong by some of them. That they can't do wrong because we've got this glorious history of doing right in, in their heads. Mm -hmm. And so there's a profound institutional reluctance in the, the, both the American and the British and many Allied fighters. I mean, there's a story that came out today in Holland that they had killed 70 civilians. And when you sit down with um, people in Syria or Iraq or Yemen or, or Pakistan and you talk to them, one of the first things they talk about is these airstrikes, is the, this Western intervention that's caused deaths. And I think um, it, it's very difficult for the West to try and stop, you know, um, crit to critique the deaths of civilians if we've got deaths on our own hands. So what we did is we looked at the number of suicide bombs uh, occurring in Pakistan and we compared them to drone strikes in Pakistan. And drone strikes led to an increase by a factor of one per month, suicide strikes. So there's an, there is a correlation there. And that correlation is absolutely denied by senior uh, allied forces uh, fighters when you sit down and explain it to them, even though the data is unequivocal. And it's a big challenge. So the last time I spoke, when I was at this conference of 70, it was 130 states meeting to discuss the uh, not using explosive weapons in populated areas, I gave my talk about numbers of people being killed or injured, and the first hand was put up saying, how do we trust your data, was the Syrian government. <laughs> and, 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 and yes, I think fake news is a danger, but you know, we get our data from things like the BBC um, and Reuters, you know, which it's not fake, it's... It, you know, they, they have good stri uh, approaches. Mm. I want to um, look at another um, topic you explore, which is the whole question of the motivation of suicide bombers. <coughs> and, uh, and you do, in the book, um, interview more than one suicide bomber who didn't make it. Or who did make it, depending <laughs> on <laughs> how you want to look at it. Depending on your perspective, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I wondered if you just read an extract, because it's a rather extraordinary interview. I had not expected her to be fully veiled. Despite having lived and worked in over two dozen Muslim-majority countries, I'd only once before interviewed someone who'd worn a niqab, a veil that covers the face, showing only the eyes. Usually it had been the men who had spoken for their wives and daughters, but then Itaf Elayan was no ordinary woman. If what she said was true, had her planned suicide attack in 1987 been successful, she would have been the first Palestinian suicide bomber, the first one to attack Israel within its borders, the first female suicide bomber in the Middle East, and the first suicide bomber. 
Itaf, now a woman in her 50s and dread, dressed from head to toe in various shades of grey, said she had travelled from Palestine to Lebanon via Syria in 1980 to undertake military training. She had been trained for 12 days in a PLO-run apartment in Beirut, taught how to use guns, how to shoot, how to prepare bombs, before heading to Jordan and from there back to the West Bank. Of course, there was an impact on the Palestinian revolution from the Iranians, she said. The Iranian re revolution was in 1979. I arrived there in 1980. And though it was well known then that the Palestinian revolution was a secular revolution, when I arrived, I saw some of the guys already praying. So I asked her, as we sat in the religious education center that she now runs with her husband, did the religious nature of the Iranian revolution affect the Palestinian secular revolution? Absolutely yes, she said. The impact of the Iranian revolution on the Palestinian cause was direct through ideology. Through our discussions in the camp, we came to the conclusion the critical success of the Iranian revolution was the adoption of a religious ideology. At the time, there was no Hamas or Islamic Jihad, but there in Lebanon, we tried to create the Islamic Jihad militia. The people in the group had Marxist and communist backgrounds, but they had been disillusioned with the failures of their movements and the failure of socialism around the world to take hold. When the Islamic Revolution succeeded, it sent out a signal to everyone that faith was required above all. It was this sense of faith that ultimately was to lead to her decision to strap on a suicide vest. My operation was the first suicide bombing attack to be planned in Palestine, 1987, she said. We started planning it in 1985. I've been deeply influenced by the suicide bombings in Lebanon, and so after if I could organize a suicide <coughs> bombing attack here. Her strong Islamic beliefs were central to the decision. In terms of Islamic <coughs> ideology, she said, the thing is you don't feel that your life is going to end when you undertake a suicide attack. It's continuity. Your life continues. You're moving from earth to heaven, from one place to a better place. That is why our notion of sacrifice is stronger. So you're saying that sacrifice imbued with ideology makes such sacrifice more likely, I asked. Exactly. It's as if you're establishing another house in heaven. There was a strategic point, too. She felt that the Israelis had helped suppress the news of previous non-suicide bombings. The noise of the Palestinian revolt was never heard internationally. Suicide bombings could not help but be noticed. Suicide attacks would really harm them and give them no way of covering it up in the media, she said. Her ambition was to build that home in paradise, though it was thwarted. Before she was able to carry out what would have been the first planned car bomb strike in Israel on an Israeli ministry building, the engineer who had built the bomb had been arrested. She said this bomb maker, who had learned his skills fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, had been tortured into giving her up, and she was arrested on the 2nd of August, 1987. She claimed she was beaten and then sentenced to 15 years in prison, only to be released a decade later after the Israeli government reached an agreement with the PLO in Oslo in 1997. The 22nd of February, 1997, she said about the date of her release, her precision adding weight to her testimony. I had one last question. I wanted to know if she had remorse about wanting to become a suicide bomber. Do you regret it, I asked. No, she said. No, not at all. Thank you. That's an extraordinary interview. And also just how you sort of wonder... Um, it is incredibly early, isn't it? That Hamas at that time is in its infancy in the mid-80s in Gaza, and she's in Lebanon. And it, it, it's just phenomenally early for, mm. for, for there to be a Palestinian... Um, suicide bomber who who is not secular, isn't it? It is, and I and I think it touches on uh, something that was happening in the eighties, which is a kind of a, 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 a real identity crisis throughout the Arab world about what it what it meant towards uh, modernization, what it meant towards uh, imperial impact. Uh, the, the, the there was obviously huge issues around what was happening in Israel and Palestine at the time, um, and of course. Um, there was this increasing um, un was discomfort that was emerged from a kind of a post-World War II American involvement in international affairs. Um, and, and all of these, I think, were in their sort of nascent form. And you began to see this sort of cropping up in, in, in quite... Um, uh, and also the, there, was, there was a lot of uh, um, talk from Egypt as well. Egypt had a major 
part to play in a lot of this as well. Yeah. So scholars leaving Egypt, going to live in, the, in um, uh, Arab lands in the Middle East, again, infuse this whole arena with questions of, um, of, of modernity of the future. In, in many ways, some of the debates that you're still seeing, you know, in the streets of Lebanon and Beirut at the moment, for instance, this sort of outpouring of anger that things were not as good as they could be. You also visit Dewsbury in Yorkshire yeah. in the book, which is <coughs> the neighbourhood where three out of the four 7-7 bombers came from. Mm. Also, you write about um, Britain's younger suicide bomber who also came from that area who blew himself up um, attacking forces in Iraq. I'm wondering, did you learn in, on your research there, did you learn things that you hadn't known before? Did you find any deeper understanding of, of motivation? Well, I, I think in terms of motivation, the um, what really struck me was the way um, when I went there, for, I, was, I was there for, for a reasonable amount of time and I, I just didn't see another Caucasian face. And I think that that, that struck me as the way that this uh, is almost like a hermetically sealed um, uh, community that is it, sort of incongruous in the sense because it, it, you kind of... It, 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 it's all in sort of old uh, factory terrace houses. You see sort of washing on the streets. It's sort of you, the, the, the way it looks could be a 19th century kind of a vista, but every single person there is got a, sort of a Pan Pakistani or Bangladeshi heritage. And yet there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be much engagement with the outside world. When I spoke to a, a lot of um, uh, white Dewsby residents and they just said, we never go there. We, why would we? Uh, all of the pubs, apart from one, had been shut down. I went to that pub, and it was filled with people who um, were absolutely for Brexit because they built, believed Brexit would stop Muslims coming to Britain, um, even though I tried to explain that that probably wasn't going to happen um, in, in terms of the sort of logic of it. Um, but but the, it was almost like that, it, that they had framed themselves as the minority, the, 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 the white drinkers in this pub. Um, and across the road, uh, you could see um, uh, four or five different mosques up and down. And I visited a, 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 a number of them. And the, the, the thing is, when you sat down in some of these mosques and tried to speak to uh, the, the local imams or, or people who may speak to some level of community, you ran up against weird conspiracy theorists as well, uh, a great refusal to address the fact that Dewsbury had produced so many suicide bombers or young men who had gone off to fight in the caliphate. Um, and what they generally felt was under profound attack by uh, the English media. So uh, there was a real sense that this was a beleaguered community under permanent attack. They got their social media and their broadcast media from satellites that was generally showing Pakistani channels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the bits when they were talked about in the press were often written in a way that was damning on all Muslims. It would, it would not talk about Salafist jihadists, it would talk about Muslims and Jewsbury, and everyone felt tainted with the same. And the young men in that region then responded with, well, if you're going to treat us in a kind of a unique way, then we will fulfill that sort of sense of exceptionalism and we will sign up to go and become fighters. So I, I think um, it, it was not an exercise in integration and I was quite, I think it, it's fair to say that it, you can lay the finger of blame on a whole variety of reasons for that. The schooling is almost, um, I mean the private schooling there is uh, exclusively Muslims the, um, the, 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 or uh, various faiths of, of Islam. Uh, the, um, the, the, the state schools are sort of 97% uh, of people who are non-Caucasian. And I, d I don't think this is particularly healthy, just as I don't think the, the opposite is healthy in a multicultural society. Um, so uh, the, the ultimate takeaway from that was both ex an excluded community whose internal messaging and debate and framing was very much fueled by messages that were either anti the tabloid pre press of, and, and the, some of the, the other press of, of the UK, as well as being very much influenced by, by media coming from places like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia.
Um, another chance for questions if anyone wants to jump in. <coughs> I think there is also an element um, of uh, despair and sometimes uh, social despair. I speak about um, Palestinian women. Some years ago, there was a journalist called Barbara Victor, American. She did a book, she did a documentary, probably almost, wow, 20 years ago. Anyway, she, she, she was trying to understand why women were going into that. And in the Palestinian... Uh, case, you could see uh, uh, girls who wanted basically to reestablish the honor of their families, uh, because, for example, Palestinians were working for Israeli and were in stained, or a, a girl uh, who was promised to whatever grand-grandfather, Palestinian grandfather, and, and rather be um, doing something for her community, like bo suicide bombing. But the despair uh, it's obviously the, the religion and the paradise, but the, the also the despair is, is very, very strong. And there were many s social uh, or societal explanation too, I think. Yeah, the, 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 the routes towards the suicide bomber are, are obviously profoundly complex. Um, so a, n a number of people have, have, have tried within the framing of the suicide bomb to explain why they are. So there's some arguments that they're all off their faces on drugs and that there are um, various forms of amphetamines or um, uh, various sort of other intoxicants. I have an issue with that because I um, actually a lot of Salafist jihadists reject intoxication and whilst you have some evidence clearly in the videos of young men who are clearly high getting into their uh, cars, um, and lots aren't and lots are very kind of m muted and, and measured in their final statement. So I don't think it's drugs. Some people have said it's depression. Um, and yes, um, you know, uh, you can always find testimonies of depressed youths um, wanting to blow themselves up. And I think depression is, is, is certainly a, a dominant feature of the suicide bomber, but I don't think it's exceptional to the suicide bomber, insofar as if you go to the communities where there are suicide bombers, everyone's depressed in one way or another. Try and find someone who's happy in Syria today, and I'd be like, well, he clearly hasn't like, looked out his house. Um, and, and yet that kind of exceptionalism doesn't uh, bode rest well with me when, for instance, I've spent quite a lot of time in Central America. Um, and I've looked at mass levels of violence and gun violence there, and I've been to the, the, the deadliest place on the planet is San Pedro Sula um, in Honduras, and everyone's depressed there, but nobody's blowing themselves up. So depression alone doesn't explain the suicide bomb, I believe. Um, and then there's the third element, which is um, poverty or the societal impacts. And again, I, I, I look at places where there's extreme poverty, extreme political pressure, extreme other forms of, 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 of misery, and I alight on Tibet. And so, for instance, you've had over 150 monks have self-immolated in Tibet in the last um, seven, eight years. Um, and, you know, a huge number of monks burning themselves to death. They're not hurting anyone else. Because I think that that, that, that desire not to hurt anyone else in their final act of outrage is rooted in a Buddhist theology of not harm, harming others because that's not good for you know, your, 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 your next stage in enlightenment. So um, I, I think that it, it, these, these factors are certainly present, poverty, uh, depression, um, abuse of women, misogyny, all of these things are, are present in environments where suicide bombing um, can be found. But they're also very much present in lots of other places, which is why I didn't want to come to the conclusion that ideology had a major part to play because ultimately I'm a centrist liberal who doesn't <laughs> like the notion that ideology is that impactful. But I, it, it, I just couldn't, I couldn't avoid that conclusion that actually you do need the promise of paradise. You do need the ideology of utopia. You do need the political framing of martyrdom as virtue in order for, the, for all of those other profound, dense background issues of poverty and, and, and disassociation and, and depression and all that, then feeding into an, a, a willful act of self-destruction in the act of murdering other people. And I suppose what's important as well is the idea of revolution mm. and that what you will do and what people have done over history of, of, 
of the history of violence in the name of revolution. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm now I was writing this book, writing the <laughs> of Brexit as this perpetual sunny uplands background, and the way that the sunny uplands, the land of milk and honey, the view from the mountain top, all of these are are profound. When you sit, you know, those of you who have been to conflict zones, you'll know that if you can promise that either in this life, and I think for the for the Salafist jihadists, the real crucial thing is the, the absolute exquisite promise, not only for you in the next life, but for all your relatives as well. Um, and and that, that, that notion of paradise and what it could be um, is, is, is profoundly under-scrutinized in terms of the text. So you read about what these young men believe they're going to get, or you speak to them about what they think they're going to get. And, and they don't mention the fact that in the text, the 72 virgins you're promised have um, skin so translucent you can see the organs and bones beneath. And that's a, that would be a peculiar uh, desire if, if, if <laughs> you'd have to really um, want something uh, odd in that scenario. They don't address the fact that um, some texts suggest that um, these aren't 72 virgins after all, but 72 almonds. <laughs> um, uh, um, the, 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 there's no, um, there, there, there's definitely text that suggests that these virgins don't have genitals, which um, possibly might explain why they're virgins, but um, so that, that could cause a problem. And, and also that um, in some texts, uh, the, there's the desire to have sex with 1,500 people before breakfast, which I think anyone here will say there's probably quite a lot before your Weetabix. <laughs> so, um, so, so all of these things aren't really properly scrutinized by those who are willing to sort of undertake um, the, that, 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 that position in paradise. And instead, paradise is sort of rather reduced as just sort of this sort of amorphous place where everything will be content, there'll be lots of green birds, and you know, you'll, you'll be in a loving embrace of your family. So it, it, it's not even that, it's not, it's not a, whereas the Russians absolutely created a notion of what a social utopia would be like, the jihadist utopia is a lot less, uh, particularly in a post-life utopia, is a lot less defined. But in terms of the jihadist caliphate utopia, so around 50% of all jihadist propaganda uh, in 2015 was about the evolution of utopia, was about what was promised. And there's an awful lot of jihadists holding up kittens. They've got a big thing for kittens. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> they really? Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, ask you to read another passage um, which uh, links back to what you were talking about earlier, and that's about the, your attention to the victims, your attention to what you were talking about before, about the casualties and the, the long-term aftermath of being caught up in, in one of these horrific experiences, what it has on, on people's lives, but also what it has on the lives of families. Mm. And... Um, it's an interview with a young man, um, his family, Martin Hakan Het, who was killed in the Manchester bombing. In many ways, Martin was the opposite of the man who killed him. He was popular, gay, media savvy, seemingly full of life. He liked how his friends called him a one-man hen knight and once claimed his life peaked when he met Mariah Carey. The last time he was seen alive, he was carrying two glasses full of wine, one for Martin and one for Martin. He had been locked out of the Ariana Grande concert after leaving to go to the toilet before the final song and had stood in the foyer singing right up to the moment of his death. Stuart was answering some office emails when the news came in. Stuart was his stepfather. Uh, about an incident at the concert hall. He didn't think anything of it until Louise, Martin's sister, came through the door saying that her phone kept going, people looking for Martin. Fegan, his mother, who had gone to sleep early, was up in an instant. You don't normally get out of bed that way, Stuart said, thinking back. But she knew something was amiss. I told her not to worry, that he'd be pissed somewhere, he said. Martin had been kicked out of concerts before for singing too loudly. But Fegan had stayed up watching the news unfold, and she knew. You know what, she said to her daughter, sitting there in the early hours, fixated on the news. He's dead. There's an emptiness. I can't feel him anymore. Martin had been the second nearest to the bomber when the explosion hit. It killed him instantly. 
For Martin, death was to cut short great changes in his own life. He had already hosted four leaving parties for a trip he was about to make to the United States, a haphazard crisscrossing of the country in a manner that reflected his impulsiveness, but a trip that was to mark a new chapter in his life. He was going there, he said, to think about his future. He had been offered a significant promotion at work and changes were in the wind. And in the moment he was killed, he was wonderfully drunk. The conversation began to waver. Memories were raw now, unfiltered, and the recollections of Martin intermingled with the chaos of events that followed. Fegan and Stewart had traveled into the city to the site people worried about their loved ones were advised to go to, the Etihad Stadium. They expected to find hundreds there, but few families were present. Mobile phones meant that most were able to make contact quickly after the event. Only the ones whose calls were not being answered had come. Then, after certainty had crept in with each passing hour, they were ushered into a room and told that Martin had died. It took five more days until they were able to see him. Nothing, said Fegan, prepared you for the coldness of his body when you hugged him. Perhaps I can take a picture of you with your hands next to his tattoo, the nurse had said, and they had done so, but they didn't know why anyone would want to look at such a thing. And in a sense, that was it. There was a funeral, two white horses and a chariot, a coffin covered with images of Martin's beloved soap stars and singers. But when the crowds had left and the journalists had stopped calling, there was a void. Fegan had always been, even with him as a grown man, his caregiver, always there, always picking up the pieces, and now there was nothing. No calls and distress saying he'd lost his wallet and he couldn't get home. No dramas in the night, no laughter. It was not a natural death, Fegan said. It was an extraordinary death. Had Martin died of a terminal illness, it would have been different. But this, this makes me feel like I'm in a different universe. My son, my son was murdered. She keeps on finding nuts and bolts in the strangest places, places where you'd not expect to. And while she's not a religious person, these small finds shock her. She puts them in her pocket. After all, it was nuts and bolts that took her son from her. I asked in what ways his death had changed her, and she was considered in her reply. When I see a woman with a headscarf, she said, I think, I bet you feel really uncomfortable in this country. And when I see a young man on a plane, a guy with a beard, I think in a calm way, you could blow this plane up. Since the killings, her life has changed. Her daughter says something, sometimes she just, not just that she has lost a brother, but a mother as well. Fegan campaigns for the rights of families of victims of terror attacks. She has traveled to the European Parliament, spoken to countless reporters, and educated herself on why young jihadists would do such a terrible thing. It has led to a sort of understanding, accepting that there was a deep dissatisfaction among many Muslims with the West's war on terror. The 9-11 attack in New York, she said, yes, that's directly linked to what happened in Manchester. Some of the decisions that our government has made, going to war in Iraq, have upset these people deeply. Our foreign policy is to blame. I saw this attempt towards empathy as painfully admirable, but others did not. One said her stoicism was inappropriate, that she should be more upset. With your attitude, the troll had written, your son deserved to die. After many hours of talking, it was clear the weight of memory was dra draining the two of them, and I said I had to go. It would be futile to try to capture the nuances of a life in a few hours, but what we had done, remembering Martin with all his highs and lows, felt meaningful. For his mother and stepfather, it was a form of catharsis, and for me, it offered context. The Suicide Bomber Act is so disruptive it goes against our concepts of fairness and love, respect and tolerance, and threatens to blot out everything with its horror. But here, in the quiet hours of, Mo of a Mancunian afternoon, a semblance of balance was found again. Thank you, it's very moving. Um, did you find it hard doing those kinds of interviews? No, I find it hard reading back. <laughs> Um, I, I always do this, uh, and I think um, it's very. Uh, I spent many years as a filmmaker, and I think you can distance yourself quite profoundly from the moment. And then when you read it back, it doesn't feel like it's what you've ri written, and uh, the memory of their sorrow permeates. 
It's um yeah it's it's a str I don't I haven't actually read my book since I finished it. So that was the first reading I've done of it. Um, and I and I th a lot of people ask you know what what does this do to you this this journey? Um, and 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 I think there is a a certain uh, the, the 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 reason I I think I was a attracted to the suicide bomber as a concept not j was just the sort of idea of um, of of the, the the numbers of people being killed by it but it was also because there was this profound absence of the bomber and obviously most people you can't interview it's always trying to trying to infiltrate and penetrate a mentality that is so far removed from most of our own um, and I think that we I think it, it's an important exercise to take if we're to be not tolerance and understanding, because it's so easy to demonize this individual and to, and to have no understanding whatsoever that led them to their profoundly awful act. But if we only demonize them, um, then I think the consequences of that demonization are even more profound. So when the Tsar's son in Russia found that his, his father had been killed and he was the new Tsar, what he did was he just started rounding everyone up and anyone who's a radical got executed. And he executed dozens and dozens. And one young man was reading in the St. Petersburg po paper that his brother had been brutally um, murdered and, and uh, hung. And he stood up and said, they'll pay for this. And his name was Lenin. And I think you, you see uh, 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 the attack and then the counterattack and the reverberations from that counterattack can be quite profound. Again, I can't deny, that I, I think it would be wrong to deny that the, the ghosts of the kamikaze were absolutely in the room when the decision was made to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The US high command said we cannot have a land invasion of Japan. It will be too murderous. There will be too many people sacrificing th themselves to stop us. And so the only way to defeat the suicide bomber of the kamikaze is through the atomic bomb. So you've got the Russian Revolution, you've got the nuclear war and the age of war, and what happened with the Cold War thereafter. And then the third thing, of course, is 9-11. And look what 9-11 has done. Look how it's well, tran transformed our society, Just in, not only in the little ways in which, um, for instance, every single time any of us want to go on a flight anywhere, we have to go through all that interminable process. Not only has it altered the landscape of London, well, if you look, uh, leaving tonight, and look around you and see how there's just concrete everywhere and, and s preventative items for terrorism, these have seeped into our every day. And I think this has utter impact on us, even though we don't see it, because it's happened on in an incremental way. If all of us went back to August 2001 and looked at London that, then, we would think it was radically different. If we took a flight then, we would feel radically exposed, even. And, and it's not just that, but it's the little things that occurred as well. The knowledge, for instance, that you know, we have been part of a coalition that, it, that caused Guantanamo, that caused Abu Ghraib. We, we've seen the atrocities that have occurred in the war on terror. And these atrocities, both committed by, th by those we've been fighting and also sometimes by us, the civilians killed and fighting, these, the, we, we cannot, these cannot be ignored. And I think that that's my point about the suicide bomber, because ultimately the suicide bomber uh, frustrates our fundamental desire for justice. The entire justice system is based, if you murder somebody, you will be caught and sent to prison, and you will face the weight of the state. But if that murderer murders themselves in the process, then we, tr we turn our invective and our anger onto other things. And I think in that, in that moment, we end up causing longer term uh, fundamental challenges to the way that justice is handed out and meted out by the state. And that ha has in turn, as we saw with Manchester, then caused people to, to re respond with violence of their own. And also, one of the greatest changes as well has been the, the, the capacity for state surveillance. And what was so interesting with <laughs> Snowden's revelations is that politically it was despite despite what he revealed mm. it was impossible to stop the legislation being brought in that has made us the most surveyed society, democracy now that there is and it, 
Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, and actually, was in this room, uh, must have been seven years ago, I met Julian Assange for the first time. And, and in this room, he gave me uh, a, a USB stick that contained the largest ever uh, containment of, of military reports leaked in the Iraq war logs. And, and embedded within there were um, you know, things like a man, uh, an uh, Iraqi militant, putting his hands up to surrender to a US Apache helicopter. And the dictum being put through from a lawyer, you cannot surrender to a helicopter. And so this young, this young man, despite surrendering, was, was mown down by the, by the US pilot. Um, it, it revealed things such as that for every single militant killed at a checkpoint, 12 other civilians were also killed unwittingly by US soldiers. Now, I try and write in the book, and I try and do it in a measured way, let the facts dictate. But the fundamental point I'm making in the book is we wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq. We wouldn't have gone to war in Afghanistan. The, the Middle East wouldn't be in the situation today had it not been for 9-11. And 9-11, obviously, the largest suicide strike that the world has ever seen. But 9-11 wouldn't have happened had it not been for the lessons learned from the Palestinian attacks that, that were against the Israelis and how that evolved. And the Palestinians wouldn't have learned had it not been for what happened in Lebanon. And Lebanon probably wouldn't have evolved had it not been for what happened in Iran. So it, it's basically taking the big step back and looking at how we have to have a major understanding, not only of the direct con co uh, context of something, but the reverberations that that might have. Any questions uh, at the back, and then we'll come to the front. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, like, as you're kind of discussing the um, kind of the causes of suicide terrorism, um, I was wondering if you'd, were you were familiar with the work of um, Robert Pape, I think his name is? Um, I think about a decade or so ago, did a really large um, empirical study, I think maybe at one point the largest that there had been, um, and he concluded that the common denominator in suicide terrorism was um, response to uh, foreign occupations, particularly by what we call liberal democracies. Um, and I was wondering, um, could you comment on that, and what do you think, drawing from that, are the implications on how to kind of reduce this kind of violence? So... Um uh, I, I really am indebted to Pape. Um, I think in, a, in, in many ways, um, Pape had defined uh, what the way we framed suicide bombing, certainly up until around 2005. Um, and, and Pape also is behind this brilliant database that was out of the University of Chicago that has recorded every single suicide bombing since 1972. Um, and certainly, if I was writing as paper done in, I think, 2005, I would exactly have said what he said, that it was driven by uh, occupation. The, the challenge um, is that we've seen suicide... I mean, in a sense, all, form, all forms of war is, is, is a form of, of, of attack over um, some form of territory. So in, in a curious sense, it, what he was saying wasn't that... Um, it was like that Klaus Witzian comment that war is an extension of politics by other means. It sounds, it's a nice sort of summary, but it, it's, it's, it's just a, stating a universal truth. So, yeah, conflict generally is about, in terms of mass conflict, is around the issue of territorial and sovereignty uh, pertaining to that. So, but I think that Pape doesn't absolutely nail it with the reality that there have been 22 suicide attacks in Western Europe, for instance. And none of those attacks have been absolutely rooted in the debate over the, the fighting of a particular territory. So people have blown themselves up in, in Germany or in, in Belgium or in France, haven't exquisitely been doing so in terms of territorial issues. What they've often been saying is, we're doing this because you bombed somewhere in Pakistan. So I think um, that there's, there's been this shift in how conflict is being fought. And I'd ultimately argue, in terms of how conflict is being fought, that the suicide bomber represents something else as well. Is that if you've been to you know, Iraq, what you, you can see is there's been an absolute, there was certainly an absolute concreting down of troops. They stopped walking in the streets, they got, got inside their enormous Humvees, and then they, they, uh, after a while they got behind enormous concrete camps and they never really ventured out the same in afghanistan and so initially what you saw was troops shifting from hearts and minds out in the fields to sitting um in in bunkers and now we've seen them shift away from the bunkers 
being in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now they're flying drone flights out of Arizona. So the soldier has been massively taken out of the modern warfare and in many ways been replaced by very evolved forms of weaponry technology like the, the Reaper drone. Whereas, uh, just as this has been happening, the suicide bomber has flourished, which is in a sense is the most intimate form uh, of violence. And from a, from a Salafist jihadist perspective, they see the suicide bomber as expressly brave. They're willing to blow themselves up to breach that city wall. They're willing to sacrifice their life. These are the bravest men they can imagine. And they're, hero they're, they're, they're glorified in ways that we, we generally don't see because we don't consume Arabic media. But amongst certain strands of Arabic media, massively glorified. Um, whereas um, what they see of the drone pilot in Arizona who's flying a, f a plane over Pakistan, they see him as the ultimate coward. Um, and in many ways, it, it raises some fundamental questions for modern fighting, actually. If the suicide bomber poses such a threat that he causes force troops to, to ultimately leave the battlefield because everyone becomes an enemy, if you, with suicide bombers as a threat, anyone who's a civilian, who looks like a civilian, could be an enemy, which is why they shot so many of them accidentally in Iraq. Therefore, you get the scenario where um, the... That if the drone pilot is the main weapon of the West today and the drone pilot inadvertently kills a civilian, how do they possibly feel about it? Because they were never under threat, number one. And number two, what's heroic about being a drone pilot? Do you give a drone pilot a medal? And I think this actually throws some really profound questions to the modern militaries of today, is, is when we use things like drone strikes and distant forms of engagement where we're never at threat, um, where is the justice of law, of war? Just war came out of this notion. The, the entire fabric of legal warfare came out of the notion that you did it to protect your own troops. It was a kind of a quid pro quo. Chivalry came out of the, word, the French word cheval, which was the knight on horseback in the battlefield. And so the presence of the soldier in the battlefield led towards an insurance policy of there being laws. If the soldier leaves the battlefield because he's, in, he's confronted by the suicide bomber, who, he, who could be anybody, and so it's much easier to do distance strikes, then you get profound challenges, I think, to notions of heroism, justice, proportionality, and all these other elements that make up modern warfare. And so I think... I would argue that ultimately the suicide bomber has really stretched the limits of conflict in ways that are, we, we've yet to really see the long-term outcome of. We've got time for one more question. If you still want to ask your question. Did you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, oh, we need wait for the microphone. Hold on. <coughs> um, so I was struck by something you said a little bit earlier was about um, the decisions and responses to the suicide bombers because the bomber's no, no longer with us and can't be punished. So yeah. um, there's a bit of an outlet of where do you, you know, um, issue the punishment. And um, I wondered if, as part of your, you know, your research, you'd look systematically at what those responses were, whether it's by police or politics or foreign policy, uh, and whether those decisions, which ultimately have long-term unintended consequences down the line, could feed back into, you know, almost like the prevent strategy, as in what's a good response, what's a bad response, what's a constructive response, what's a very, very unconstructive response, essentially to lead towards lessons learned to how we respond to those sort of activities. So um, Rumsfeld, um, straight after 9-11, was in a bunker um, uh, with um, a bunch of other very leading American politicians, and he said, we've got to evade Iraq. And everyone turned around, what, what do you mean? It was, there's no evidence this was done by Iraq. He said, no, but we, we've got to go bigger than Afghanistan. It has to be, we have to show the world we're not going to have this attack. So immediately at the get-go, uh, proportionality is lost. Um, and, and we saw it with 7-7. So Theresa May instructed there to be troops on the streets of London to protect us from suicide bombers. Was that proportional? No, I don't think so, because... Um, you know, what were they going to do? Start just shooting civilians just randomly. Um, I read a few days after 7-7 that the SAS were posing as homeless um, in the streets of London uh, in this attempt to, to prevent future suicide attacks. And I thought this was so egregious, this notion that our special forces were dressing up as the homeless. Um, and, and if you were a Salafist jihadist, you'd 
first thing you'd do is go and stab every single homeless person you'd find anyway. But I, I thought this was so such a uh, an unnecessary and, and lacking in intelligence as sort of a, a tactical maneuver that I put a freedom of information request in to ask this. Is it true? To confirm or deny if this is true. And they refuse to tell us this. So uh, under the, the auspices of security, we are not allowed to know if members of our own military are posing as civilians, which I think is fundamentally of concern, because if, if I said that this was the case in Argentina or in China, well, for China is probably self-evident, but if I said it was in, in a place of where there was despotism, you'd be like, well, that's the first cudgel of a despot, as you have you know, plain-clothed people armed going out into the streets, potentially with a carte blanche to kill anybody. And, and, and so to me, whilst um, we, the, the structures of justice are still uh, in place in the UK, what, what, what I think is that when you look at the more egregious elements of it, um, you, you realize that there's been an erosion of that justice system by this sense of war and terror. So there are people who have been arrested and imprisoned for having the same information I do on my laptop and, and, all it, and, and yet the police have never come and knocked on my door and tried to arrest me. So, is it, so are we in an environment where you, you know, uh, what's that, um, uh, that film where they, they can envisage the future and then stop the crime? Minority Report. Minority Report. Yeah. It's a bit like Minority Report. Where, you know, in order to stop a suicide bomber, at what stage do you stop them? Do you stop them when they're, you know, uh, 18. My, my daughter said that in her school, if you ask too many questions about bombs in your chemistry class, you have to be reported. Wow. And, 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 and it's these little nuances. And this might seem fine to us when we sit here, that this is all acceptable. But then you go and see, sit down with people in Dewsbury, and they know this stuff really well. They know the slights. They know the arrests of, their, of, the, of the people in their community. And to them, they see it as they are a community under attack. And, and this, I think this is ultimately the point, is that it's so easy just to read, you know, somebody arrested for, you know, for, for retweeting a jihadist statement. Um, and um, it's about, I think, in order for us to protect the sanctity of, of the, 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 the way that the law operates, we do have to challenge this at every single level. Otherwise, there will be mission creep and things will be taken away from us that we will only be aware of that absence when we need it the most. And I, th I think it's a, it's a difficult line to draw. And, I, and the, the challenge is ultimately you're always up against this notion of national security. But just very finally, the thing which I always find intriguing is this intersect between national security and the preservation of our safety and financial gain. So I went to security uh, gr uh, uh, conferences and um, exhibitions where there is so much money being spent to preserve our notions of security, but with very little scrutiny of how that money is spent, because you can't ask the questions because it fits under national security, and nor can you ask um, the utility of such spending. So again, there's huge amounts of money, and, and I mean, the UK isn't the worst of it. The US I mean, not even billions, like hundreds of billions of pounds spent on things desire, which you can never really question. And the, the terrible thing is if you begin to question it, you're, you're, as I have frequently been, you're labelled as unpatriotic or, you know, uh, a scaremonger or whatever. Um, so you, you, you get into very strange areas. But ultimately, what I think the, the point of the book is not only to chart this broad history of the, the, the notion that to blow yourself up to achieve a utopia has appeared and reappeared in different communities in different locations, and that one person's acceptance of that can then have a reverberating into other groups' acceptance of that. That's the one thing which I wanted to co come across. But I think the other thing which I try and stress is that the real danger that when the outrage is so extreme, our response immediately oversteps the mark. And along the way, things will be lost that we never even realize until we most need them. Thanks for a really fascinating discussion. Thanks Thank to all of you for your great questions and for coming tonight. And sorry. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, it's an important book. I hope you'll read it and you can buy it tonight. And Ian will sign it. Well. <laughs> Thank you.